That's good. If you have your Bible, I'd like to turn to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9 tonight, please. Hebrews chapter number 2 and verse number 9. Scripture says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. <laughs> Father, bless this holy book now. In thy name I pray. Amen. What that means is that he tasted your death so you won't have to. That's what that means. It means that he tasted the death of the life that you were living before you got saved, what you owed God, and how you'd sold yourself to sin. He tasted all of that so you won't have to. Thanks be unto God. Here's one man's definition of grace. Grace means more than favor. It is favor on God's side and signifies everything for nothing when we do not deserve anything. That's pretty good. In other words, everything you receive from God, if you receive it by grace, you can't earn it. And you don't deserve it. Deserving is reward. An arrogant man and a proud man will never understand grace. Because an arrogant man and a proud man always pays his bills. And he doesn't expect anything free. And so therefore he cannot conceive how that he can be saved or receive anything from the Lord completely by the grace of God, free, no strings attached. But grace can only come that way or it's not grace. And this is why there's such a controversy among Christians today about Ephesians chapter number 2. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, get a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But that applies to everything that God does by grace. Graces, the graces, divine love and protection bestowed freely on people, the state of being protected or sanctified by the favor of God, and excellence or power granted by God. These are some of the definitions of graces. The graces in humanity and life are mercy, loving kindness, forgiveness. These are graceful things. Somebody's wronged you, yet you can forgive them. Somebody hates you, yet you can love them. Somebody's trying to work against you, and yet you'll pray for them and really mean it when you pour your heart out to God. These are gracious things. The Bible said when the Lord Jesus Christ was preaching 2,000 years ago, the gracious words that fell from his mouth. If you don't have grace in a church, you have the opposite of it. You have legalism. Legalism makes proud people feel good. Legalism is arrogance. Legalism is rebellion against God. Well, how in the world could God love me if I don't please him? He doesn't love you because you please him. He may answer your prayers in a certain way because you please him. But it doesn't love you any more or any less because you please him. You can't earn the love of God. A proud man and an arrogant man can never understand that. <laughs> to whom much is forgiven, the same loveth much. The sinner that's been forgiven for a lot can forgive. If you've ever really experienced forgiveness, I'm not talking about intellectual forgiveness. I'm talking about the lifting of a burden. The condemnation of sin and the burden and the load you carry. And as you live through this world, that load builds. A man that's lived for 50 or 60 years without God has a load like you wouldn't believe. And only the grace of God can lift that load. He can run to religion. He can run to his priest or his preacher. He can run to psychologists, psychiatrists, shrinks, but they cannot lift that load. The only way that load can be lifted is by the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. The grace of God. The Bible says in Exodus chapter number 13 verse 17, it came to pass 
when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. Gently he led them in a different direction. Why did he lead them that way? Because they weren't ready for war. And he did the same for you and he did the same for me. The grace of God knows what path to choose for your life, not you. You see, that's grace. That's grace. The grace that brought them out of Egypt with the Passover land is also the same grace that guided them through the wilderness. He doesn't extend grace for one part of your life and then leave you to run the rest of it. Grace for every single need we have. We don't deserve it. We do not deserve to be forgiven. But God doesn't forgive us because we deserve to be forgiven. He forgives us because of what Christ did for us. He forgives us on the basis of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not on us. Not on our church. Not on our religion. Romans 5.20 said, More of the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin did abound, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So that can make no difference how great the sin is. Grace is even greater. I wish you could tell them that up here at the courthouse. When the judge looks at them, sends them away for 30 or 40 years, locks them up, slams the door in their face, and then for the first time in their lives, they come face to face with the reality of the choices they've made. It's a hard thing. It's a hard thing. I've read stories about people after they've been locked up for a few days and the reality of it hits them, they start screaming. They can lose their mind because they can't handle where they are. Their life has completely changed. Their freedom's gone. But sin does that to you whether you're locked up or not. It's so subtle and so deceptive. I know, preacher, and I'm trying to get victory. You can't get victory over it. You'll never get victory over sin. The victory's already won at Calvary. The Bible said he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. When he shed his blood, he gave you the power in the blood to overcome sin. The power's not in yourself. It's putting faith in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that blood is given freely by his grace. Amen. Because if you overcome it, then you'll brag about it. And then your flesh will exalt itself in the sight of God. And no flesh will ever glory in his presence. No flesh will ever glory in his presence. Anything that has to do with sin, redemption, salvation is out of your hands. It's in the hands of God. And then he gives you a free gift and says to you, here it is. Do you want this gift? All you've got to do is receive it. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. But you can't give some people. They won't accept a gift. I'm not worthy. Nobody's ever given me anything. I'll pay you for it. No way. You cannot pay him. It's the grace of God. And the Apostle Paul was hard on the legalist because he said, if it's not by grace and if it's by works, it's no longer by grace. And if it's by works, there's no justification in it. For there's no flesh that will ever be justified in his sight. By the keeping of the law shall no flesh be justified. And the law outside of the grace of God, the only standard of righteousness is the law. Outside of the grace of God, the only standard of righteousness is the law of God. And the law of God is a pure standard of righteousness. But tell me how you can attain it. If you break one point of the law, you've broken it all. And nobody's ever kept the law but one, the Lord Jesus Christ. That humbles people. They don't like that. Job 1.10 said, Hast thou made a hedge about him, about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. You know who said that? The devil. Satan. <clears throat> Satan is very observant. Uh, is there any lie about that? Let's see. Hast not thou made an hedge about him, and about his house? True. And about all that he hath on every side? True. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands? True. And his substance is increased in the land? True. Every word Satan said was the truth. Here's the problem, was the application. Satan also said, skin for skin, all that a man hath will he give for his skin. Is that true? 99% of the time it's true. 
It's true for most of the people you know and work with and live next door to. Because their flesh is number one. Self. You don't have to tell people to love themselves. They love themselves by nature. So what was the point in the book of Job? God proving to the devil that righteousness was greater than his lie. That God was worthy to be served. And that by serving the Lord he would come out of his darkness and know more of God that he did in the beginning. He would know more in the end. And by knowing more about God in the end it would raise Job to a much higher level than he ever was before. Job says, I abhor myself. I despise myself. I repent in dust and ashes. Why? He said, I spoke about you, but I didn't know you. Now I know you. He learned him in those 42 chapters. He learned a lot about God. And the point with Job is the point with us. He wants us to learn about him. And when we are gracious enough ourselves to receive the grace of God, the grace of God will bring salvation the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. The grace of God is the Lord Jesus Christ Himself is grace. Grace for grace, the Son of God. So God's able to do above and beyond all that you ask or think. Thanks. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. He said, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I wouldn't choose that. That's not an easy road He just mentioned. The Apostle Paul said that God said after I required, inquired of him three times, my grace is sufficient. So instead of removing the affliction, God ministered grace to him. He ministered grace. What does it mean, preacher? That means that God sustained the Apostle Paul by grace where Paul could not sustain himself. Paul figured that he could not make it unless this affliction was lifted. He could not make it in life. He couldn't survive. Paul was not going to be able to live unless this problem was removed. God said, I'm not going to remove the problem. I'm going to minister grace to you that will lift you above the problem. And the problem itself will minister grace to you through my grace and it will make you better than what you were. And you'll have a faith when you come out of it you didn't have when you went into it. And the faith you came out with will be the faith that will help other people minister Christ to them. And Christ will be formed in you. Amen. We can't do it ourselves. Amen. This is why you have to humble yourself before the hand of God. Sometimes you would choose to end your life because life can get so hard. You'd say, it's my, I'm going to end my life. Are oh, you God? I've been in a place where sometimes you want to end your life. You can hurt so bad you don't want to live. Your life can be so messed up that you don't want to get up the next day. So what have you done? You take a gun and blow your brains out. You take your life into your own hands. You know what you've said? You've said, Lord God, I stopped trusting you now. I finished it at this moment. And from here on out, I'll take the reins. That's what suicide is. Is it not? Yes, it is. It's you rebelling in the face of God. Well, what if it gets bad, preacher? He knows it's bad. And the Apostle Paul said, I reckon the sufferings of this life are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. Life's not easy, folks. Don't listen to some preacher get up and tell you that all you have to have is enough faith and everything will be moved out of your way and all your obstacles, you'll jump over all of them. You'll be healed of all your diseases and no sickness, no sorrow, no, no trouble, no pain. That's a lie straight from hell. That's a lie from the pit. I could probably give you the records of some of these people, some of the biggest healers that's ever lived in America. Some of the biggest healers. When they got sick, they went straight to the doctors. One of the biggest evangelists in the nation. I mean, he was one of the big healers and a big evangelist and all that. And they, and they caught him drunk driving out here on the road somewhere in Texas or somewhere and opened up the, up, up the tailgate of his car, the back hood, and the, and the liquor bottle started falling out. That's the real world. My faith's not in them. My faith's not in a the man. They're just like me. They can live in a fantasy world if they want to. They can make up a world if they please. I live in the real world. And the real world is my grace is sufficient. Now God can heal you. I don't know what the, Paul's affliction was. That's a waste of time to conjecture. We don't know. We don't know, folks. We don't know what his problem was. So I've heard the arrogant preachers get up and say his problem was pride. Oh, is it really? Is it really pride when he said, among men I'm the chief of sinners? 
He said, I'm not worthy to be called an apostle, persecuted the church of God, oh wretched man that I am. That doesn't sound much like pride to me. Somebody said, well, his problem was he was a little man of short stature and he couldn't see very well. Well, is that so? <laughs> I mean, you hear everything in the world. Just, you know, let a lot of it fly across the top of your head. They don't know, folks. They don't know. And you know why they don't know? Because the apostle, because God did not specifically pinpoint a sin or a problem or a sickness. Because if he had, and you ever had it, you'd, know, you'd say, oh, that's it. That's what Paul had. And then you'd identify yourself with Paul. You can't do that. You can't do that. You have to humble yourself before the mighty hand of God. That's not easy to do. It's not easy. Most Christians that I've known in my Christian life, and they're good people, good people, as long as it's going okay or tolerable, they can shout the victory and glory to God and hallelujah. But you let the garbage start coming in on them and you let the bad days come and the evil days and the problems start arising and man, they're ready to quit and throw up their hands and run off. I've seen people go through some horrendous things and come out stronger. And I've watched the grace of God minister through that. And I'll tell you one thing, when I watch a Christian go through pure hell on this earth and see the grace of God ministered to that Christian, it strengthens me. It does. It strengthens me. It, it feeds me. It, and you know, I mean, I may say that in a selfish sense, and I don't want it to be simply about me, but the truth is, when you see real faith put to the test, it will minister to you. It will minister to you a whole lot faster and quicker and better than some blowhard preacher who's, uh, you know, can tell you uh, uh, stories and get you crying and all of that. But the truth of the matter is, he won't give you the reality of what you may have to face in this world. It can get hard, but it won't be so hard he won't be with you. His grace is sufficient, he said. And I thank God for that. <laughs> I thank God for it. Second Corinthians 9, 8, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. The grace of God abounds to us. Listen to this. Courage is the grace of fearlessness. It is born of truth. It is dominated by righteousness. And its highest form is begotten by the fear of God. <coughs> Those are powerful words. The word of His grace all fears doth efface. Not one can live in the light of his face. I'll read it again. The word of his grace all fears doth efface. Not one can live in the light of his face. In plain words, if you have the grace of God working in your heart, it will dispel the fears that Satan will use because fear hath torment and Satan will f drive fear into your soul. Fear the unknown. Fear of God. Does God care? Does God love me? Does God even know anything that's going on? And these fears cannot stand in the face of God. They flee. And the grace of God drives them away. That's something. It's something. You get a phone call and says your daughter has been involved in a car accident. You get a phone call and says, uh, this doctor's appointment you had the other day, they'd like for you to come in. They'd like to talk to you about some things they've seen. They've found some stuff that uh, they'd like to talk to you about. You think to yourself, what in the world? Then you get in there and have a doctor's appointment. The doctor says, I'm, I found something here. and I, It's a spot, and I don't like what I see. I'd like to run some more tests to find out what this is. So they run the test and come back and say, well, now you've got a spot on your lung. And... Uh, I don't like what I see, and we're going to have to do a biopsy. And then they come back from the pathological report and says, uh, you've got lung cancer. And we don't give you but about six months to, year, to a year to live. That's rough, isn't it? So what do you do? You humble yourself before the mighty hand of God. That's the first thing you do. You bow down before him and say, you're the Lord God Almighty. You know about my spot on my lung. You know about every breath I breathe. You know about every tick of my heart. Lord God, I live and die by thee. You're going to make the difference whether I make it another day or another six weeks, another six years. My life is in your hands, God. Here I am. Lord, help me. Help me, Lord. Help me. 
And in the name of Jesus, I plead the blood of Christ. And you said, by your stripes we were healed. So I plead that upon my soul and upon this sickness. You know what you've done? You've cast yourself before him. You know, you've cast yourself before him. And if you get the grace of God in your heart when that happens, it'll take all the fear away because the fear will drive you insane. You ever wake up in the morning and just have, uh, they call them panic attacks? You ever had a panic attack? <laughs> I never had a panic attack in my life until about a year ago. Panic attack. Then one guy went down here to uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and a nurse, is, a nurse practitioner looked at me and said, now when your, blood, when your, when your uh, uh, ejection fraction gets below 30, she said you could die a sudden death. Just like that. Now she said that, not the doctor. A nurse practitioner is a step below a doctor. And uh, she said, now, but you're okay because yours is 40. <laughs> that could have driven, I could have walked out of there thinking, man, I'm just liable to drop dead at any minute. A few months ago, I did this. I got on my knees and I said, Lord, and I did. Now this may help you. I don't know. I've tried to, tried to help people, folks. It's not a game. I haven't been playing a game for a year. But I got on my knees and I said, Lord, I'm a preacher. I'm here to preach. That's what you call me to do. That's what my life's about. I'm here to minister the Word of God. I'm going to get in that pulpit and I'm going to preach. You give me the strength to preach. If I drop dead in that pulpit, I drop dead in that pulpit. But I'm going to preach. That's what I live for. That's what I told him. You know what he told me? Preach, son. And at that moment, everything started changing. Strength started coming to preach. But I had to make a decision. What's your decision, preacher? It's simple, folks. My life is in the hands of God. It's in the hands of God. So is yours. It's in the hands of God. Every one of us, our life's in the hands of God. But some of us don't know it. <laughs> Yes. Some of you think your, hands, your life's in the hands of your doctor. You're, when you look at that doctor, think of that doctor as a hammer, a drill, a saw, uh, a, a tool. That's what the doctor is, a tool in the hands of the great physician. That's what he is, and that's all he is as far as it goes. <laughs> I like this one, though. Psalm 68, verse 13, Though ye have lion among the pots, yet shall ye be as the wings of a dove covered with silver, and her feathers with yellow gold. Did you hear that? You've been lying with the pots, you've been, you're filthy, you're contaminated, but he said, Ye shall be as the wings of a dove covered with silver, and her feathers with yellow gold. That means God's going to clean you up by the grace of God and, and clothe you with righteousness. Yeah. When I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said to thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. Live is not a request. Live is a command. Why wallow in hog droppings when you are a son of God that can sit at the king's table? Why listen to the devil that will beat you to death? And as long as he can keep you under condemnation... And intimidation, you'll never be able to reach up and take hold of who you really are. Listen, folks, you don't make yourself a son of God. You are by the new birth. Once you are a son of God by the new birth, you have a right to the throne of God. Let us come boldly to the throne of God, to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Boldness there is not arrogance. Boldness is assurance. It is as a son of God, knowing who you are, that you cry out to the Father and say, Abba, Father, Father, I love you, Father. You belong to me and I belong to you. These requests are given as a son in belief and trust in the grace of God and the mercy of the Lord. Oh, what a blessed thing. I can minister some things I couldn't minister a year ago. Some of you can minister things that you couldn't minister a year ago. Some of you a year from now will be able to minister to people you couldn't minister to right now. 
You won't be able to, but you will. God will take you through places that you never thought existed on this earth. And when He takes you through them, He'll bring you out and you'll be far better equipped to minister the grace of God. If I got up here tonight and read all of the stuff that comes in on the Lion of Judah, read it, and I do on occasion, just get on there and look. I mean, it's, I post it. I post all that comes in on the Lion of Judah. Log on, go to prayer page, pick, click on that little girl that's praying, go to the prayer page, pull up the prayer page. It's to date today. It's, a, it's dated today. That's how current it is. And start reading that long page. And some of these people are desperate. They're desperate. They're right. Because they want prayer. And they're looking for somebody that cares. Does anybody care? Some churches don't care unless you've got plenty of money to put in the plate. They don't care unless you've got something to offer them. Let me tell you something, folks. You take one in that doesn't have two nickels to rub together. You take them in. You minister the grace of God to them. Let God Almighty begin to change them. Let Him begin to bless them. Why would God bless somebody in a, in a, in a, in a rebellious uh, uh, con condition? He's gracious if He does. But you sit here tonight, a son of God, you've been blessed greatly. We've been blessed. We've been blessed greatly. Yes, we have. We have been blessed greatly. God's been good to me. He's been good to you. If you don't think He has, take a trip to the third world country sometime. Go to Haiti. Go to Haiti. Look at that place. You'll find out what a blessing is all about. Or go over to Syria where they're blowing them all to pieces. Bangladesh. Try that one. Madagascar. Some of these other places. We've been blessed greatly. And we get whole hum and take it for granted. And the Holy Ghost looks at us and says, you don't appreciate anything you got. You're unthankful. Oh, you give lip service to it, but you're not really thankful. And that unthankfulness is one of the worst things that can happen to us. But if you find some soul that comes staggering through that door, it can't rub two nickels together. Some of these girls have been sold into prostitution when they're just kids. They don't know anything. All they know is a hell hole. Sold into it. <coughs> Human trafficking is one of the worst things happening today, and it's all over the world. It's everywhere. And she or he comes into the house of God. They don't smell good. They don't look good. They're not part of us. But they're a soul that Christ died for. Amen. So what do you do to them, preacher? You turn your nose up? No, you minister the grace of God. That's what you do. But you have to have spiritual discernment to do that. You can't become what they are. You want them to be born again. But you have to minister the grace of God. Forget cleaning up the outside of the cup until you get the inside clean. And make no mistake about this. Once that inside is clean, that outside will clean up. Religion wants to clean you up from the outside. Put a little bow tie on you and a little ribbon in your hair and stand you up and gloat in what they've made out of you. But all they've done is create a monster. The grace of God cleans you up from the inside and humbles you. And the outside will ultimately clean up. That's the grace of God. That's the grace of God. That's the grace of God. And it's a wonderful thing. Because you wouldn't believe how black and how deep and how dirty the hole was that I came out of. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. The queen of graces is humility. Humility is the queen of graces. It does not seek the throne of eminence, but the throne is adorned by it. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. That's, I think that's good. It doesn't seek it. You see, the Lord's going to surround Himself one day with the redeemed. He'll surround Himself with the redeemed. 
And when he made all this, when he started it all, he knew what was going to happen. He knew Satan would fall, folks. He knows it. He knows the end of the beginning. If somebody ever wanted to twist you and turn you every way but loose, they could if you don't have the answers to some of the questions. And one of the, one of the questions would be that posed to you, well now, since God knows all things, yes He does, well then why did He make man knowing man would fall? How would you answer that? See? How would you answer it? Since He knows all things, why would He make the anointed cherub that covereth, knowing He would become Satan? Why would He do that? The Bible said in the church right now that He, may, that he makes known the manifold grace of God. In the church right now, He makes known the manifold grace of God. Now listen carefully. It's very important. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Timothy, I am a pattern for them that should hereafter believe on Him. You know what he means by that? He says, I was a dirty, rotten uh, abuser. I was a murderer. I was a low-down scumbag. I, I was an enemy of the church of God. I persecuted them. I led them back to be stoned to death. I was headed to Damascus with letters to the synagogue to take any of that way and carry them back with me. And he met me and came to me and convicted me and turned the light on inside my soul and saved me. That is the pattern for them that should hereafter believe on Him. The dirtiest, rotten, low-down, stinking filth on the face of the earth, the grace of God reaches down and saves them. Now that's not the end of the story, that's the beginning of the story. That in the ages to come He might show that wisdom from eternity past into eternity future. And we as His bride, here we are tonight, the bride of Christ, born again. No Old Testament saints born again. Okay. Folks, if you're reading a commentary in a man, he doesn't know that the Old Testament saints not born again. He doesn't know the difference between the two. Don't bother with him. And I'm not trying to be mean, but don't bother with him because he is so messed up it's not funny. In Colossians 2 it says that you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of this death. The New Testament was not enforced until the death of the testator. We are born again. Nicodemus, you must be born again. The relationship he has with his bride right now is such a personal relationship because through us and by us we become the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, and in the future he will beget spiritual children through us. I can't explain all that that means, but I do know this. I do know that in the future Every soul that is ever born again in the future will be born again through the ministry of Christ and His bride as they minister to humanity. And He's got all that laid out for us in the future. And that's coming. And He's laid that as plain and simple as He can in the Bible. And that's coming. That's coming. And thanks be unto God for it. And you in the future will be so glorified, such a creature that God has made in His image. And He has. The only reason you can't see that image now is because you're in a body of death. But the Bible says the day is going to come when this body of death is going to fall away and then we'll know as we are known. Then we'll see Him as He is and we'll be like Him. We will be glorified like Him. We won't be Him, but we will be glorified to the point in the millennium that when a mere human being looks at you, he'll think he's looking at an angel of the Lord with the glory that goes with it. Why? Because God has raised you from the dunghill to the very image of God. He hasn't made you God. You can't be made God. That's blasphemy. We don't become God, but we will become like Him in His image, the image completely restored, that all of humanity in eternity future will all come through Christ and His bride in a spiritual union and a spiritual birth. And that will be through His church, through His bride. And so everything up until Christ and up until the bride of Christ, all of that up until that point was nothing in the world more than a prelude. So here we are tonight. This place would be shining like you wouldn't believe. The light would be bouncing off of these walls. The glory would be so bright that it would blind this natural eye if He took us out of our bodies and left us here right now in this room. 
You, if Michael or Gabriel walked into this room tonight, into this house that we're in right here, if they walked into this house, Daniel fell to his knees when he came in contact with one of those angels. He literally fell to his knees and shook and, and, and quaked and began to worship because he was in the presence of holiness. And that's exactly what you're going to be when you leave here. This vile body that you dwell in right now. And that word vile, translated vile, doesn't mean filthy. It means weak. This weak body that you're in right now is completely incapable of going to where he is. So you have to pull it off, take it off, unzip it, <laughs> throw it down, and be carried off as that spirit and soul glorified and redeemed. Then he puts on you a glorified body, like into his glorious body. And that body's going to shine. It's going to shine. And once it starts shining, folks, it's going to shine to those who live on this earth and those who are born on this earth. That's the grace of God. So what about the Old Testament saints? They're in the future. The Old Testament saints are in the future. It all started with the church of the living God when the glorification took place. It all started with the bride of Christ. And that's who we are tonight. And by grace are you saved. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray you'd use what I've said, Lord, for the glory of God. Help us tonight, Lord. Satan's come down here and Satan's beating people to death. Satan's lying and he's intimidating. And my Heavenly Father, he's a liar and a deceiver. Satan is a liar. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. And for his sake we ask it. Amen. Sister Brewer, would you sing for us?